I also get intimidated by these. So um, I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say about this. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, so uh, I am going to start with where I've learned everything except for um, from the mistakes I've made clinically. So I think these two articles are just super nice reviews, um, especially the Doppler one. I'm not going to lie. I've probably looked at that a total of like 20 times over the course of, you know, the years that, that I've been doing this, like I'll forget things or be like, oh, I think I remember something in that one article and I just have to go review it. So I super love the Doppler, um, the Doppler ultrasound of the liver made simple. And then the, um, the specific, I, I prefer if at all possible pediatric specific things for liver transplant, because it's just different. Um, you know, the complications, especially hepatic arterial thrombosis, the dreaded complication, um, those rates are higher in kids, probably just because of size constraints. Um, the other thing is kids, kids, kids undergo liver transplantation for a lot of different reasons compared to, you know, the HCC or alcoholic cirrhosis that we, or hep C cirrhosis that we used to see before the um, new medicine came out. Um, a lot of them are, uh, so the most common by far and away is biliary atresia when you look worldwide. Um, at our institution, we have a sort of a different patient population with um, a big Amish referral, um, which is kind of nice because those patients, um, depending on the disease that they present with, sometimes those patients don't have end-stage liver disease, so they're not sick, if you will, at the time of transplantation. So um, when you have somebody with biliary atresia, failed CASI, and now they have um, like fulminant hepatic failure or cirrhosis, those patients have a higher rate of complication compared to patients who don't have end-stage liver disease. Um, so it's kind of nice that we have a, a mix of super sick kids when they come in and then also kids that are not that sick who typically do um, very well. Um, I'll talk about um, anatomy because I feel like this is like the biggest um, thing that you have to wrap your head around besides stop, physics Doppler. <laughs> um, so I, I love the, the image on the right is um, from, so our uh, liver transplant team gives all of their trainees and rotating um, like people, like the adult transplant fellow, the peds transplant fellow, they have this book where they give them this anatomy, which is super helpful, I thought, for me, because it's what they do here. And this is what they do typically at most pediatric institutions these days. Um, so the whole um, or standard liver transplant um, used to be the more common thing. Now everybody has what's called the piggyback um, anastomosis because there's a little bit uh, better rates or lower rates rather of complications. Um, so just remember if you, if you know that the patient has a piggyback anastomosis, there's going to be some thrombus in that little um, nubbin of leftover IVC from the from the donor, so don't freak out. Make sure it's not in the patient's actual IVC. Um, more commonly, what we do is these um, living donor um, transplants. So by far and away, a, a partial or a segment or a split liver um, transplant is, is what we're gonna see, at, at least at our institution. And I think UNOS is trying to, UNOS, I always say UNOS, like the Spanish way of saying it. Anyway, they're trying to increase rates of um, living donor um, transplants to increase the pool, basically. Um, so we're seeing a lot more of these. Um, so you're going to have a little bit of heterogeneity along the cut surface always of these patients. Um, the, the biliary anastomosis type that they do will also a little bit depend on the size of the patient. So um, with the whole liver transplants, they will do an end-to-end -end biliary anastomosis in bigger kids. Smaller kids, it's just too small of an anastomosis, so they'll do typically a hepatogojejunostomy, and so you'll have a little bit of bowel um, posterior to the liver that's just kind of chilling there. Um, depending what vas vessels they're left with, you will see a lot of vascular conduits with these. So um, just remember to, I'm going to say this over and over today, read your op note. <laughs> like you have to know the operative anatomy before you go in there. And I think the hardest thing is before the op note is in the chart, because sometimes that can take a, a couple of days, you know, if the, especially if they've had several transplants back to back, um, it can be hard to figure out what's going on. Um, one other special situation that I wanted to talk about, I hadn't heard of it until I came to Pittsburgh. They'll do what's called a domino liver transplant. You do have to have a bigger transplant team to be able to do this because you have two transplants going at one time. So the most common um, 
uh, like disease that allows them to do this is maple syrup urine disease. So, you know, whatever enzyme that liver is missing in the in the patient with maple syrup urine disease, if they take that liver and put it in another patient who has liver disease for some other reason, the enzyme is present in the rest of the body and it can make up for the lack of enzyme in the liver, which I think is cool. So you get two livers, two transplants at one time. Then one other thing I wanted to bring up is this um, splenic artery ligation, which um, is another thing I, I'm not sure I was very familiar with until I came here. And I asked the surgeon, um, you know, like, so when do you do that? When do you not do it? And he was like, well, if it looks like the splenic artery is going to steal all the blood from the hepatic artery, we'll do it. But what's interesting about this is at imaging, I can never actually see that there's evidence of a ligation. So like if you do a biphasic CT, at least in my experience, um, you'll see normal enhancement of the splenic artery. Um, you'll just see like a little clip, like um, kind of near the origin of it. Um, I don't know if you guys have had that same experience where you can't actually see that there's been a ligation. Yeah. My, uh, my surgeon, when I first started here was like, you were talking about the splenic artery, it's ligated. And I'm like, it's there, my man. <laughs> anyway, okay. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned that because, you know, we always do Doppler. So it's always at least present by Doppler. I'm not sure if our surgeons like do that. Uh, or the ligation routinely either, but I almost always see Doppler. Yeah, um, that's just one of those interesting things. Um, okay, this is like, if if I ever get my surgeons to 100% of the time give me this post-op anatomy worksheet, I'm just gonna like quit and like retire and be happy. Ideally, I would love to have this anatomy for every single transplant we do because inevitably there's something weird that has happened. So if you look at, this was one of the times that I was like, hey, Kyle, I'll buy you a beer, please, please, please. So he, he drew this lovely um, graphic for me and this was the money information. So this, this patient's donor has had an accessory left hepatic artery that they didn't anastomose. So they knew that part of this liver, the part that was supplied by this accessory hepatic artery was going to not have arterial perfusion and likely infarct. So we kept seeing this over and over and we didn't freak out because we actually knew the information this time. Um, I don't know if you guys have had success getting your surgeons to give you something like this. Yeah, I was going to mention that. The, so probably about a year ago, we worked with our Epic team to, they actually have, there's a bunch of different graphics that most of them are copied from that radiographics article. And then there's a few other ones that have some basic variants of anatomy that the surgeon can actually insert into their op note. Uh, so they have started doing that pretty reliably, reliably, which is super helpful for us. And then they can actually, there's some function in Epic where they can actually draw if there's some kind of variant or some, if there's not a default picture that exists for whatever anatomy they're trying to depict, they'll actually draw a little thing on it. Uh, so they that's attached in every op note, which is really, really helpful. And then we've also had our sonographers for the very first Doppler that they do, they'll print that out and they will scan it into the into packs and put that in the exam just because it's easier for the radiologist to reference it rather than having to dig through the op note, especially for kind of follow-up exams. Yeah. So we, we've been doing that. It's really been helpful. And I, I think even outside radiology, I think everybody else really likes to have that reference of what the anatomy is available just for just so we all know we're all, we're all on the same page. I'm so jealous. Yeah. One, of my, <laughs> one of my texts, um, like, promotion projects was to try to get these worksheets on every patient, which was not successful. I don't blame them. These guys are tired after doing crazy procedures for so long. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to make sure we are switching to Epic at this institution. I forget when, and I'm going to make sure that that's going to be an option. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd be happy to connect you with our Epic people that work with us on that. Yeah. It's, it's super helpful. Yeah. Agree. Um, okay. Yeah, my brain thinks in CT. So just some normal anatomy at CT um, where, so this is a, uh, a patient who had hepatoblastoma. This is what a normal segmental transplant looks like. So obviously in this patient, we were not imaging for purposes of, um, you know, like looking for a vascular complication. We were looking for tumor recurrence in this patient. Um, so, you know, it's, the orientation is a little bit different in kids uh, with a segmental transplant compared to a whole liver transplant or a larger patient. 
because you have an organ that's oriented like this, and then they kind of rotate it to fit up and down in the patient's right side of the abdomen. So everything's sort of oriented up and down, like um, the portal vein sort of has this weird candy cane morphology as it comes around. Um, I'm going to skip the second axial and hopefully show you a coronal. There we go. So you can see, um, you know, this rulum is, is at the posterior aspect of, of the allograft. The hepatic veins are still oriented up and down, but the portal vein is typically oriented up and down too with this like kind of crazy curve that comes around. Um, we have had people um, confuse the rulum of the hepaticojejunostomy for a fluid collection. Um, so just remember, typically um, with the segmental transplants, you'll have a little bit of posterior um, rulum um, behind the upper aspect of the liver. So don't make that mistake, which we, we have done before. One other thing I thought would be helpful um, is to talk about like what we should be looking for, depending on what um, abnormalities are, are present. And um, I should put this in my disclosure. My husband is a pediatric hepatologist, and I can't tell you how many times he's been on the phone with a consult saying, you know, they're not, they're not actually liver function tests. Uh, what, what it, you know, did you check this function, that function? Anyway, so um, most people, when we say uh, like LFTs, liver function tests, they are just thinking about AST and ALT, like the, the big ones. And those are really just markers of hepatocyte integrity. So if you have um, like a segment of dead liver, that's going to be elevated. There is always a transient bump in all of these um, enzymes after um, in the immediate transplant period, but they trend those um, as the patients in the ICU and recovering, and those typically go down as long as there's no complications. Um, in the pediatric population, uh, GGT, the, um, oh God, I should put what that stands for, like gamma glutotransferase something. G it's just called GGT. Um, that is the marker of bile duct integrity in a pediatric patient. If you have open physes, ALKFOS is typically less helpful because you have another source for elevated alkaline phosphatase. Um, so if you have a patient where they're following like, or there's concern for hepatic arterial thrombosis, um, we'll obviously talk about this, but the hepatic artery is the main source, the only source of um, blood for the bile ducts. And so, um, you know, that's one of the things that we'll be following. If you see them say elevated GGT, pay close attention to that hepatic artery and the bile ducts, obviously. One other thing I was, um, that I learned, uh, I'm, I'm like, I didn't learn anything until I became an attending, I feel like, but not too long ago when I came here, um, if they say low platelets, really pay close attention to the portal vein. Um, uh, obviously in the pre-transplant setting, we all know this because these, pa these patients who have end-stage liver disease, portal hypertension have this ginormous spleen and it's just gobbling up all the platelets. But if a patient has dropping platelets in the postdoc setting, pay close attention to that portal vein. Um, and then when you talk about liver function tests, that's like the coagulopathy, all the other stuff that the liver does. So um, INR and albumin being able to, the relevant clotting factors. Um, and then the other thing that they'll uh, talk about with function is um, glucose levels. Obviously the liver plays an important role for that and ammonia. So uh, hopefully that's helpful for somebody. Um, okay. When do we do liver transplant ultrasound? Uh, we have a protocol that our surgeons have come up with, and this is what we do for every single patient. So in the OR, they do two uh, intra-op ultrasounds, once after the arterial anastomosis, like when they're basically done with all of their um, important vascular anastomoses, and then we do one just before they close the skin. Um, keep in mind, they don't always close the abdominal fascia of these patients, especially if you have a big liver and a small kid and they can't just physically um, squeeze that liver into the abdominal cavity. Um, but we'll do the, an ultrasound right before they close the skin. Um, then we do one ultrasound every morning for the first five days postoperatively. Um, the other thing that we do at this institution, and there's definitely some variability with what um, the surgeons want at different institutions, um, we do surveillance ultrasounds and they do surveillance liver biopsies actually at one year and five years looking for that silent um, silent graph. No, it's called late allograft fibrosis. It's like a clinically silent, they can't tell it's there. And so at our institution, our surgeons have chosen to um, do biopsy for surveillance regardless of what the liver enzymes show. And then we do ultrasound um, immediately after. Um, then obviously if there's like, you know, persistently abnormal liver enzymes or, or something is wrong with the patient will um, do ultrasound more frequently. If somebody has had a complicated operative course, 
we will definitely do more ultrasounds looking for certain things and I don't hesitate to ask for another ultrasound if they're if the patient's clinically well sometimes the surgeons will be like oh well we don't need it the kid's fine um, and then sometimes we'll say the ultrasound is normal but they still want more frequent ultrasounds and you know that patient has something something is wrong with them or had a had a tenuous intraoperative course maybe um, for at our institution if we have con if there's concerns for vascular problems we'll do CT typically a biphasic in the arterial and portal venous phases. And then MR we use for um, mostly biliary issues. I don't know if you guys have started doing any sort of MR angiography, looking at the vascular complications yet. Or are you still CT? Yeah. Yeah, we're still just heavily CT for, for post-op stuff if, if ultrasound is not, um, not clear. Um, okay, this is what we do at Children's. And I, I would love to hear your protocols actually too. So in the post-transplant setting, we don't have patients fast at all. So we just take them as, as they are. Typically in the immediate post-op setting, they are fasting because they're in the ICU, not eating. Um, it depends on the patient size and what kind of windows you have. And I just put this picture in here because it can be incredibly challenging to find a place to put a transducer to be able to even find things. Even if you have the bandages removed, use sterile gauze, you have like your probe cover and everything is sterile, it can be challenging just with the staples on the skin to be able to see really well. And then you have all these JP drains curving everywhere. Oftentimes there's pneumoperitoneum in the postoperative setting normally, and so that can be hard to see through. So I, I just give my text props all the time because they, they give us beautiful images with very challenging situations, oftentimes with the surgeon like looking over them. Um, anyway, okay, so then we start with grayscale. Actually, usually they start with Doppler, but in the protocol, first comes grayscale, um, both still images and cinematic images, uh, focus mostly on the liver allograph, looking at the parenchyma, looking at the bile ducts. And then we also do dedicated fluid evaluations. Um, the pleural space we always include in our um, view because there's almost always a right side of pleural effusion in these patients. And so we just sort of give them a look of the size of that. Um, we also look for any fluid collections around the allograft. Sometimes, um, like, especially if the indication is like infection or, you know, fever, elevated white count, something like that, we will make sure that we get extra images along the incision, looking for pockets of fluid along the, um, like, under the chevron incision. Um, and then we'll do a survey of the lower quadrants. Um, for Doppler. So we Doppler everything. <laughs> multiple times. My techs probably hate me because I keep adding sites to the protocol, but um, we'll do the, obviously the hepatic arteries, the portal veins, the hepatic veins, and the IVC. And we try to get Doppler tracings at um, like upstream from whatever the anastomosis is at where they think the anastomosis is, and then within the liver parenchyma itself to look at um, downstream waveforms of the hepatic artery and portal vein. And I'm curious, actually, so we recently changed our protocol to include angle correction of our hepatic arteries so we could get true velocities, like if there was a change in over time or something like that. Um, what have you guys decided to do with angle correction or not? We do do it. Yeah. Same. Yeah. 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 For, all, for, yeah for hepatic artery and portal vein. And then I'm also curious for the hepatic arteries and portal veins, how far distal do you go? We, we recently changed that. So we used to go pretty far distal into, you know, trying to follow branches as far as we could. Uh, we kind of changed that now. So like for the hepat hepatic artery, we just do kind of the main kind of right and left branches and don't really go further downstream than that. Is How far distal do you guys go on those vessels? We don't go crazy because my text would kill me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, as long as I have, I think our protocol says two waveforms like within the liver parenchyma. Yeah. Um, the one caveat is if you see some like arterialized portal vein flow, uh, our protocol does, especially if it's a post liver biopsy patient, um, they have to like trace the hepatic artery down to look for that AV fistula, um, you know, which is not too uncommon of a complication post biopsy. Right. And then and one other thing I'll mention is we have a little bit of variation in our timeline of, you know, when we do these scans. Um, I was just recently talking with one of our transplant surgeons about this. They actually have a weight-based cutoff on how frequently they do these exams. So if the kid is under 30 kilograms, then they'll do it immediate post-op on post-op day zero, and then they'll do it on every morning on days one through five. If the kid is over 30 kilograms, then they'll do it immediately post-op, but then they don't have a true scheduled follow-up for those kids. They just kind of do it if they're suspecting a complication. 
I'm not entirely sure what their basis is for that. I didn't ask them that yet, but I imagine it just because I'm imagining that the technical factors of the surgery are much more difficult in those smaller kids. So they have a, they're suspecting they may have higher rates of complication, but at least that's how we divide it. So less than 30 and more than 30 kilograms is, and they kind of have different schedules of when they get scanned. Yeah, it's really interesting, the practice variability. Um, yeah. it, it's just kind of crazy, but I, I think it is because of just the technique. Right. Um, it, do they have any like provisions if it's a tenuous intraoperative course? Like I know our, our surgeons will be much more, you know, watchful and watch kids a little bit closer if there's been like a hepatic arterial thrombosis in the OR or, or something like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they have a very low threshold to to scan these kids if there's, you know, any degree of concern whatsoever. Yeah. But. Yeah, same. I feel like whenever there is concern, you kind of get the sense of it because they would follow it twice in a day. Even, so, yeah. Yeah, you're like, oh, they must be worried about this kid. This is the third exactly. time I've seen him today. Like something must have gone on, <laughs> even if I didn't yeah. get the off note. Yeah. Um. Yeah, just because the angle correction, you you have to have angle correction to be able to get an accurate velocity just for completeness because you can't divide by zero and get a real number. Um, on my machines, I can tell if the tech has angle corrected. Um, we are a GE facility for multiple different reasons, but non-angle correction, the gate of the Doppler is like up and down. And then if it's angle corrected, it's like an obliqued thing. Um, and we could talk about these gate sample sizes and other technique things to... Um, to improve our technique, but thought I'd throw that in there. One other thing I definitely want to get your um, thoughts on is what what do your standardized reports look like for these um, for these ultrasounds? I keep mine super. So I'm sure you guys have, no, have noticed this. I hate dictating numbers into my reports. Um, like you know, we don't dictate numbers for all of our CTs except for you know tumor sizes and stuff like that. So we we do it for ultrasound because that's that's the way we're trained and that's what everybody else does. So I I I don't put all of the like RI ranges for each vessel and I don't put like a maximum um, velocity or you know peak systolic velocity of anything. I will say I almost never get to use this normal report because something is always a little bit off, you know. Yeah, th these these reports have been challenging just because, like you talked about before, there's just so much variability in the anatomy of what these kids might look like. So for for our renal transplant template, I, I told you guys in some previous months we use that program called Modlink that automatically transfers all the numbers over for us. So for a renal transplant, you know the anatomy is much more predictable, and so we we've, we've been successful with that, getting all those velocities to automatically populate over into our report. The RIs automatically come over, so. And it's nice for for follow up just because it's in a very kind of systematic organized report. And then if you're you know looking at a follow up, it's very easy to if you want to see what was the number before. It's easy to go back and find it. For liver transplants, it's much more challenging just because, like I said, there's so much variability. So we we have not been able to come up with a standardized reporting template uh, to get all those velocities to automatically transfer. Um, so overall, I, our baseline report is pretty similar to this, especially with regard to the velocities, or sorry, with the uh, with the vessels. Uh, but like you said, you know, if, if there is something abnormal, then I will usually just put the the peaks as talk velocities or the RIs, you know, only for that abnormal vessel, and then just kind of say, you know, everything else looks normal. So overall, I, I think these are definitely challenging to report in a kind of organized and consistent way, just because of how variable they are. But um, yeah, I, I personally only report the, the velocity in the RIs if they're kind of out of what I consider to be normal range. Yeah, or change from prior maybe. Right. Yeah, or improving. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like for us, like um, here at CHLA, it's, um, there's no standardized reporting, but when I was at Texas Children's, there is. And so in that case, um, which I've personally adopted now, like it'll have <clears throat> some of like the normative values already there, so you don't have to look it up. And then I guess you could choose to just say like within normal limits or um, actually, you know, like report out the specific um, peak systolic velocities and RIs as appropriate. Um, I like having the normal values in the, in the template. Um, I think that's great. I find myself having to review this stuff. Like I just can't keep numbers in my brain. It's one of those things, or at least certain numbers I can't remember. Um, 
we I've chosen to put them in all of our protocols for our texts. And that way, when an old when, when a radiologist is like, what do I do with this? I'm like, just print out the protocol and give it to give it to the radiologist. Or at least it will have like references so they can go look it up themselves. Yeah, and we have it. I don't know if you guys use PowerScribe, but we in the fields, you can also have like like what sometimes we have a little reference on the left side. If you're when you go into fill in a field, you can have the description, have the normal values in it. So that's kind of a way that the radiologist can reference it, but it doesn't end up getting embedded into the report. So sometimes it can be a little bit cleaner sometimes to do it that way. But um, I, I definitely do like in general having a quick and easy reference to, yeah. to see what we should be comparing to. Yeah, especially if you're at a remote site and all the printouts on the wall are yeah. right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, yeah, I find I find this the most challenging because you know you read about all of these abnormalities and oh my gosh, be worried about this, be worried about that, and then you also read that it's normal for these things to be abnormal in the immediate postoperative setting. Um, so uh, you know that heterogeneous grayscale appearance. I'm always like, well, is this is this developing ischemia? But my surgeon um, he described it as like they get two syringes and they flush that allograft out before they like put it into the patient. So of course there's going to be some grayscale changes, um, at least for the first few days while that all that stuff clears out. Um, I think the hardest part is the there's normally some anastomotic edema in the immediate postoperative setting. And so there's definitely going to be some sort of waveform changes early on. Um, and that's where I think follow-up is just maybe the most helpful thing to do. Um, uh, in comparing with prior. Um, supposedly in the literature, you can see because there's altered lymphatic drainage in the immediate post-transplant setting, they like disrupt all of those normal channels, obviously. Supposedly you get some transient lymphadenopathy. Um, I thankfully haven't been in a situation where that's like mattered very much. Um, it's always pretty obvious that they're just like little reactive kind of shoddy looking lymph nodes. Um, yeah, so just some examples of normal because um, I had one recently that was pretty normal. <laughs> so um, the hepatic arteries should have a nice brisk systolic upstroke. Um, you know, the acceleration time supposedly should be less than or shorter than 0.08. Um, the, yeah, I like to think of the um, systolic like waveforms as half dome in Yosemite, like arguably one of the most beautiful places on earth, but um, Half Dome even has this like little dichrotic notch at the top. So I, I super love this mountain as a, as a way to remind residents, like it needs to be flat up as the, as the, um, as the blood flow is coming in. No, no like delayed acceleration times. Um, everybody talks about resistive index and um, I know we already talked a little bit about angle correction, but you don't need to angle correct to get an RI um, because the units cancel out, right? Um, I, I don't know what you guys also use for um, resistive index, like what you will call normal in a pediatric patient versus an adult. Supposedly in the adult po patient population, post-transplant it's 0.55, and their upper limit of normal is 0.7. Um, in the peds literature, I've, I've seen them be a little bit more generous as high as 0.8. Is that kind of what you guys use? I do. Yeah. Yeah. 0.5 to 0.8 is kind of my internal yeah. benchmark. Um, yeah. yeah. And there is, I don't know if you're going to get into the, the peaks this talk glossy days as well, but there, there was a nice paper that was from Toronto from a couple of years ago. Um, and they talked about if the peak systolic velocity in the hepatic artery was less than 200 and the RI was between 0.5 and 0.8, then those were most likely to have a normal follow-up at one year. Um, so that, that's kind of what I've adopted as my kind of internal benchmark is, is those two values. I have not seen that. Make sure you post that or well. <laughs> put it in the chat or something. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll talk more about this. High RIs are not specific at all, so it's not helpful. If you have a low RI, obviously that's more worrisome, but you can be more helpful in your reporting. And then this is our normal um, acceleration time, a nice half dome up. Um, oh, the portal vein, <laughs> normal portal vein. It's normal to have a little bit of um, like spectral broadening, heterogeneous flow in the portal vein in the immediate postoperative state. Um, and then the hepatic vein, I am okay with the monophasic hepatic venous waveform in the, for the first few days. Over time, you should start to see a little bit of um, phasicity at all. You know, you like to see that triphasic waveform. I find that that's rarely what I actually see. Like, I don't see that reversal, that A-wave reversal very often. 
And then just um, a couple um, cines looking at the grayscale appearance. So I think this was a whole liver transplant. Yeah. Um, and there's always like crazy bright periportal fat in these patients. The other thing I see all the time is a little bit of fluid along the falciform ligament. You can see that like over here, especially in the whole liver transplants. That's just like one of those things. That's just the way it looks. Um, so I don't call that a fluid collection um, as long as it's like confined to the um, falciform ligament region. Sometimes there can be like a little echogenic fat in that too, which um, I've seen people confuse for an occluded vessel, but just make sure you're looking in, looking at the right space. Um, oh, this is just another close-up of that falciform ligament with that echogenic fat along it. Just one of them normal things. I'm not sure why the fluid likes to accumulate there and stay there, but it just kind of does. Um, okay, I also want to talk a little bit about contrast. So we do not routinely give contrast, um, even if there's concern for arterial problem, because I find my surgeons want to go to CT um, anyway, because they want that for operative planning. If it's a patient they're going to do something about, um, what, how about you guys? Yeah, we are, we're similar. I really interested in this. I have talked to our transplant surgeons about it and they're interested in it, but it's one of those things where it just, it's hard to implement it in real life clinical practice. Um, I don't know if there's a role in kind of incorporating this into some of those initial post-op exams just on more of a screening basis. But yeah, I, I find that when there's true clinical concern and there's, you know, like we said, these are very kind of high stakes exams, you know, they want something they're comfortable with and something that we're all kind of know how to read and all those types of things. But, um, you know, I, I think this, it seems like it'd be pretty easy to do, you know, all these kids already have IVs, uh, it'd be pretty easy to incorporate maybe into doing as part of a screening. And I, I know that that paper out of, I think it was Riley Children's where they, um, where they did do that as, as part of their kind of initial screening examinations, they did contrast at some point. Um, so I, we, we've not done any of these yet, but I, I think it really potentially has some, some clinical in, implications that uh, we just need to figure out what they are. Yeah, same. I think with screening, I mean, if it's proven to be helpful in the long run, then I guess it's worthwhile since we're doing it anyways. But as far as like the acuteness of it, like, I don't think it's ever going to be well implemented, at least at our institution, just because like, you know, it's always going to happen after hours. And then um, depending on that, you know, like the radiologist may not be present. And then we have trainees who kind of cover and those are always like rotating um, trainees. And so overall, logistically, I just don't think it's going to be uh, feasible. Yeah, that, that's definitely a good point. I think a lot of pediatric hospitals are like that, where there's heterogeneity in the level of services that we offer at different hours of the day. And yeah. you know, something like this, it's something you would want to offer 24-7 if you were going to do it. So that, that's definitely a big challenge as well. Yeah. Um, I've heard, I think it was the Boston group. There was, so the, um, lipoprotein shell of the contrast agents have hepatobiliary metabolism. So I've heard, um, some transplant surgeons are a little bit hesitant in a brand new liver to have the shell may or may not be metabolized. Although it's like such a tiny dose that we give. Um, the other thing I think maybe there's a role for this is a lot of these patients will have at least a little bit of an acute kidney injury at the time of their transplant. So it might be an alternative in a patient who they can't give iodinated contrast to safely, although that's, that's not that common. But um, I have a couple of examples. Um, this was a, a six-month-old with biliary atresia, which for me is like the red flag number one. If it's a patient with biliary atresia, be on the lookout for some sort of complication, again, because they're sick at the time of transplant. Um, anyway, we have these not half dome looking um, uh, arteries, uh, so delayed systolic upstroke, little bit of on the borderline lower eye side. Um, they actually thought that this patient had a hepatic arterial occlusion and they weren't going to do anything about it because this patient was so far out from the time of transplant. And so they basically were like, well, let's just do it to confirm that it's happened. And I love this example. I'll just show the stills because there was arterial enhancement um, like within the allograft at the port of hepatis. You can see where there's an abrupt cutoff, like probably just beyond the anastomotic site. Um, I also think probably this patient did well because there was there was blood flow getting to that artery somehow. So there must have been some like collateral formation for the contrast to be able to get into the um, artery. Um, and it's still enhanced before the portal vein. So 
this patient actually was not doing too, too terribly. Um, just one other example that my surgeons uh, asked for us to do contrasting and ultrasound. It was a patient who had um, methylmalonic acidemia. She had a transplant one month ago. She had a known hepatic arterial thrombosis um, intraoperatively, and she just had persistently elevated ASDLT. So they wanted to confirm that this was indeed infarcted liver, um, which of course it was. There was no enhancement, um, but we kind of knew that on the grayscale images. Um, you know, just one of those one of those things they wanted to document, I guess. I don't know. They asked me to do it, and so we did it. How about elastography? Have you guys incorporated elastography into your liver transplant population yet? And how? Are you using native liver values? We have not. Um, yeah, I've been, been discussing elastography with some people even outside of transplant just for, you know, Fontaine kids. And it's, you know, there's, there's really just not a whole lot of data in the pediatric population in general, I think, for liver elastography. Uh, so we we have not incorporated this. I'm curious if either of you have and how you've done it. Uh, but yeah, we, we personally have not. No, we have not either. I, I had the great idea, like, oh, we're getting biopsies. So let's do elastography right around the time of biopsy. The problem was none of our livers were normal. So there was at rejection or, you know, something was wrong on the biopsy of just about every single patient. So um, we use them to, we don't say, oh, this is concerning for cirrhosis. Once we hit a certain, you know, speed value or something, we, we do follow them over time, um, mostly in the outpatient setting, not in the immediate post-op setting. Yeah. I know, there, I know there's some data in the adult population that shows if you're if your liver stiffness is below a certain value, then you can avoid biopsying those because you're unlikely to find anything. But yeah, like I said, I, I think in the, the pediatric world, I, I struggle to, to know what to do with these. Yeah. One day we're going to be able to yeah. diagnose that silent <laughs> late allograft fibrosis with those, but not yet. Um, okay. Before we go like to more cases, I, I would just tell you my approach. And the biggest thing is all day long, I blow through cases without having any history, but this is the one time that I will definitely stop, try to find the op note, try to, you know, try to find as much information as I possibly can. Um, and I will also like vessel by vessel compare to prior to see, especially if I'm looking at something abnormal to say, okay, well, is this improving? Is this getting worse? What's happening? These are also the patients that if I'm reviewing the images with my text, which Honestly, usually these happen at like four o'clock in the morning. They like go up before they start their day as they're, you know, these, they know these are going to happen for the first five post-op days. So I have to send somebody else back up when I, when I show up at eight o'clock um, and review the images of, that they've gotten. I try my hardest not to send the text back to get extra images in this, you know, employment <laughs> environment. Um, but this is the one time I will say, hey, you know, we need to see, see if you can see the anastomosis or proximal to the anastomosis or whatever. The last thing I'll say is um, I trust my surgeons more than I trust myself with these patients. They, they know the operative course, they know what the kid looks like, um, and they can read these studies as well as I can, probably better than I can. Um, most of what I've learned in the past, you know, seven, however many years I've been here now, um, is from them. Um, the other thing, and this was one of my surgeon's sayings, not mine, I feel this, I feel bad about this, but they say, don't trust a kid with biliary atresia. And most, they, they just mean don't trust a kid who came in sick. So somebody with hepatic failure is going to have higher rates of complications, have a harder time postoperatively. Um, okay, we're going to start with cases. So this was a 23-month-old with methylmalonic acidemia who had a transplant three days ago. So this is what she looks like, a little bit on the maybe delayed um, systolic upstrokes, but not too bad looking. Um, the velocities aren't super, super high. And then one day later, the tech couldn't find arteries anywhere. And so I, my favorite thing is when they label the hepatic artery an area. So they can't see the pancreas, so they say pancreas area. Here they said hepatic artery area. Um, so this is the hepatic arterial thrombosis. Um, we know this, but um, this is the most dreaded complication of a liver transplant because this is the sole blood supply to the biliary system. So you have issues with um, uh, parenchymal necrosis and biliary necrosis. Um, I find the, the, the easiest thing to diagnose is the thrombosis because you're going to have these very abnormal waveforms. I have a harder time predicting who's going to um, you know, go on to thrombose their artery when there's a little bit of an abnormal waveform. 
So this is one of the reasons we go, we put our gate up above proximal to upstream from the anastomosis at the anastomosis and then downstream to the anastomosis, trying to look for any aliasing, look to see, you know, is it just in one part of the liver? And we should be concerned that there's like a pseudoaneurysm post biopsy, pseudoaneurysm, uh, a fistula rather, post biopsy. And if these are the ones that if there's any sort of weirdo waveforms, I recommend close follow-up. So I'll send the tech back if they haven't got given me those three, those three gates. Um, the other thing I find really challenging about this is, and this is probably one of the things that your, your, your surgeon's over 30 kilograms protocol is different. Um, bigger patients are just different. Um, so they can have normally low RIs um, and be totally fine. One of the things is, the, the velocity. So if you have an angle corrected, um, you know, you can trust your waveform and your velocity to be actually correct. Um, that's helpful. The other thing is I find that if they still have that brisk systolic upstroke, and if they have that preserved dichrotic notch at the top, um, that makes me feel better regardless of what the RI is. And my surgeon just tells me it's, it's easier to anastomose a big artery versus a tiny artery. He said that to me several times. Um, I don't know if you guys have better ways to be able to say, oh yeah, this is a false positive versus a true positive with the low RI. Yeah, I think those are tough. You know, it's almost expected those initial post-op exams, you're going to have that spasm and edema. I feel like almost all the time those look abnormal and it's, yeah. like you said, it, it's very hard to predict which one of those are going to, you know, progress to thrombosis versus just be typical post-op change. So I, I think that's why the you know, the clinical course and just kind of close follow-up is really important in those just to make sure that it's resolving as expected. You know, if you see that immediately post-op and then, you know, day three or four or five, it's still looking like that and the velocities aren't getting better and the waveforms aren't improving, then would make me a little concerned. But yeah, I, I think that's where those, those close uh, follow-up really comes into play. Love me some follow-ups. <laughs> Oh, this is from that liver Doppler um, made simple art article. And I just, um, I changed the words a little bit because it made more sense to me to like think about like where we're sampling compared to the, um, you know, compared to the narrowing. Um, and obviously the parvis, parvis at TARDIS appearances within the allograft. So look beyond the stenosis because you can't get blood flow there. Um, just another companion case. This was a two-year-old with biliary atresia. So don't trust this kid. Don't trust this kid's vessels. I'm sure the child is wonderful. Um, but it's, we're early on in the um, post-transplant setting. And I cannot remember why this patient had an irregular um, uh, heartbeat, right? We have like an irregularly irregular uh, pulse, but we have some abnormal waveforms here. Um, I cannot remember why we didn't... Um, like why they didn't want to do anything about this, but, um, oh, two days prior, kind of backwards, sorry about that. We had super high um, resistive indices, like maybe there's a little bit of um, diastolic flow, but maybe there's not diastolic flow. Um, and then two weeks later, this was this kid CT. They, they chose not to do anything. They, you know, tried to, they try to do medical intervention as much as they can. So heparin or Lovenox, whatever they want to do, but this patient still had this ginormous, um, like area of um, hepatic necrosis, unfortunately. Um, it's just one of those things. Um, okay, not case one. So this was a patient who, um, oh yeah, maple syrup urine disease. So I'm not sure if this was one of the domino transplants or not, um, but this patient was pretty far out. So 10 months ago was his transplant and he came with, they always say elevated L LFTs and you have to go look which, which which liver functions or enzymes are abnormal. But I love these waveforms because they remind me of um, Sleeping Beauty with like the spindle that she like pricks her finger on. Like these are high resistance waveforms, like regardless what the RI actually calculates to, depending where the um, tech puts the diastolic cursor, um, like super high resistance. And unfortunately we can't be particularly helpful here. By far and away, the most common cause of a high RI is gonna be rejection, especially in the like later setting, if you're looking at a, a liver that's been in place for at least a few months. Um, but there's like lots of stuff that can cause a higher RI. That one happened to be rejection. You know, recurrent disease, recurrent cir cirrhosis, if you're pretty far out from the transplant, even just a postprandial patient supposedly can cause high RIs. I've never seen a postprandial patient be that high of an RI though. Um, one companion case, because I love this one, another, another methylmalonic acidemia patient, 
who was actually newer. But one thing about these patients who have um, some of the genetic reasons for doing the transplant, they have a hard time with nutrition optimization postoperatively. And so this patient also had these crazy high RIs, you know, 0.77 doesn't make you feel like, oh, that's high. But if you look at the waveforms, these are those sleeping beauty, like I'm going to prick my finger on these systolic peaks. No, it's not half dome. It's, it's way too spiky. Um, and there was some reversal of diastolic flow in this patient. And this patient had too much lipids in her TPN, um, which is kind of funny. Not funny, but like, yeah, they can fix that. They just need to optimize the TPN. So they had given her fatty liver basically with a stiff liver causing these high RIs um, in the post-op course. Okay, this is moving on, different subjects. So again, we have a biliary atresia patient decreasing platelets. So now I know I need to look at the portal vein very closely because for some reason that spleen is gobbling up these, these platelets. So on the grayscale appearance, they're like, you know, I have a hard time with grayscale images. Sometimes it looks like things are narrow, but then you put your Doppler um, gate on it and it looks beautiful. This one looked narrow, but on the color Doppler imaging, there was definitely some aliasing uh, kind of posterior to the allograft. And then this is what our spectral waveforms look like. So upstream, we had a uh, velocity. The scale is not the best, but our velocity was not high. Um, in the allograft, our velocity was not high, but then right at that area of aliasing, our velocity is super high, which is why the scale was what it was when the tech sampled it. So um, this patient when underwent CT prior to um, our interventional radiology colleague was coming in and look at this teeny tiny little thread-like um, portal vein. Hold on, I'll stop it. So if you follow this guy, that's the portal vein. Yes, we're our timing is not great here. Don't judge me in my text. Um, portal vein is that guy, super thread-like narrowing, and then it opened back up over here. Um, so my baller IR colleagues went, they did a transhepatic um, portogram, I guess, showing this abrupt like cutoff of the main portal vein. They did their plasty. And afterwards, there were still all of these collateral vessels. Yes, there was some flow across that portal vein, but um, these patients are at risk for esophageal bleeding, esophageal varices bleeding. Um, I think all of these collaterals are just really frightening to me, honestly. So how do you diagnose portal vein stenosis? I would love to know if you guys use particular numbers in the literature, supposedly if the ratio of the not stenotic segment to the stenotic segment is three or four to one. That's how you can call it. Um, I feel like I've seen a gradient like that and my surgeons are like, ah, whatever, who cares? So do you, do you just cheat looking at platelet levels or what do you guys do? Um, I think for like the standardized report that we used to have, it's the same like three to four. Um, of the stenotic, and then I think it's the, compared to the pre-stenotic segment, um, or greater than like 200 peak systolic velocity with angle correction. Um, but yeah, I mean, you just report it and then they either continue to follow it or, you know, do a CT, which is basically the the usual follow-up um, if they're truly concerned or not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I, You know, these are nice that it, oftentimes they have a zillion comparison exam, so you can kind of get an idea yeah. of what's happening over time. You know, if, if it's looked like that for several exams and, you know, maybe you're not quite as worried versus if it's more abruptly, abrupt onset, then, you know, it might be more concerning. But yeah, overall that, that velocity and, you know, it's again, it's, I think it's hard sometimes to discreetly identify where the anastomosis itself is, you know, especially with the hepatic artery, the portal veins a little bit easier, but, um, but really, you know, we can, guesstimate that this denotic segment is probably in the region of the anastomosis. So that, that's kind of how we typically uh, describe it. But, you know, your criteria here generally, you know, you know that, that velocity of three to four, and then really the, the evolution over time is really what I mostly rely on. Yeah. Um, I remember when I first started here, there's always a size mismatch between the donor's portal vein and the this tiny little kid's portal vein, unless they had portal hypertension, and then there's less of a discrepancy. But um, it, there's always like some crazy turbulent flow as the portal vein kind of comes around and there's always a little bit of a size mismatch, but I've only ever seen like focal narrowing upstream from that. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. And then one, my, one of our surgeons always says, if anybody's going to clot their portal vein, it's going to be a biliary atresia patient. Um, 
I hate to pick on those patients, but they, they just come in oftentimes very sick at the time of transplant. So also they have like friable portal veins, apparently for some reason, I'm not sure why. Um, I'm curious if you guys have seen this. We're almost done with my cases. So this was a seven month old with biliary atresia. He actually had complications related to a bio leak. Um, they had a, they had a drain in and there was this little bit of like kind of septated fluid that ended up being um, bile. But there was this super echogenic area near the porta hepatis that we kept seeing on studies. So this was a, a trans view of it. And this is a linear high frequency SAG view of this very echogenic fat. I've seen this a couple of times now. This patient actually had a CT because of his bile leak, not because of the psychogenic thing. And it's almost like the fat of their rule limb, like it was almost like an a mental infarct from their hepatico-jejunostomy um, on this thing. And you can see this little bit of, of stuff kind of posteriorly here. Yeah. Have you guys ever seen that? I couldn't, I didn't spend too much time looking in the literature, but um, it's just something fascinating we've seen a few times. My I have not said, seen that. It's very the surgeon's like, what is that? I'm like, remember that fat? It's just the fat again. <laughs> I yeah, don't. Interesting. I, I haven't seen that either. Because um, initially when I saw that image, I thought it was going to be a uh, hemorrhage. Like, yeah, because we usually see that. And then there's a case where it was that bright, but then um, on the cine, you can actually see blood coming out. So it's like a clot and then active bleeding. Yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, kind of like in a similar area. That's crazy. Um, I imagine it would be painful, although I think a liver transplant is also pretty painful. So, um, I've also seen surge cell look like that. I think I have an example of, oh, it's like the next case after this. So this was, a uh, um, moving on to the hepatic venous slash IVC complication. So this was a patient who had a super flat, um, hepatic vein. There was aliasing at his anastomosis with the cava. Um, and this was, I think, a change from prior. And so we knew this was going to be a hepatic vein um, stenosis or occlusion um, right at the anastomosis. And his CT was just a beautiful nutmeg looking liver. Um, the thought for him was that his fluid collection had kind of had kind of pushed his, uh, changed his anatomy at the anastomosis. I'll stop it up here. So supposedly this is more common with segmental transplants because those are more prone to like moving just a little bit or with breathing up and down, or this kid had this fluid collection posteriorly, oh God, but I can't show it to you. Whatever, what's that one? Um, my baller IR colleagues then um, went and did a plasty of this also. So they did a transjugular approach, plastied at the narrowing, and then there was nice flow. The one other thing I wanted to point out, and this was another echogenic focus of uh, what, was initially called thrombus in the cava. And this is not the piggyback anastomosis because you can see it kind of goes down like a native cava would look like. Um, but on the cines, you could sort of see that it looked sort of extrinsic. It was like peripherally, like posterior. Um, and this was just, if you if you read the op note, they put like a ton of surgicil posterior, posteriorly to stop bleeding. So this was just surgicil, not thrombus. Um, yeah. Okay, last case. So this was a six-year-old with hepatoblastoma, not far out from transplant with elevated liver enzymes. And they had done a, a biopsy, which showed cholangitis. And this is just my reminder, if you have, if the reason you did a transplant was for tumor, don't, for look, don't forget to look at tumors on all of your imaging. So this, this kid had a pulmonary nodule, unfortunately. Um, we've seen um, hepatoblastoma recurrence. And then the other thing is, PTLD. So if you have huge lymph nodes that you see at your porta hepatis, go cheat, look at your EBV levels, Epstein Barr virus levels, um, to be able to make that diagnosis or suggest the diagnosis. I guess they still have to biopsy it to get their pathology, um, you know, tell what type it is and all that good stuff and how they're going to treat it. But anything else you guys would like to add? I would love more pearls from you. <laughs> One other question I had for you guys was on. Yeah, hepatic venous complications, I think, are definitely more rare. But yeah. you know, one thing I have our time with is the phasicity of the hepatic veins. Do you really, you know, defining what the phasicity is and then knowing what the significance of it is, I, I find challenging. I don't personally pay a whole lot of attention to it. Do you guys think about portal vein waveforms all that, or hepatic venous waveforms all that much? In the immediate postoperative setting, 
I'm okay with it being flat like a pond. Yeah. Theoretically, over time, it should get some phasicity. Um, you know, usually there's going to be some sort of liver enzyme abnormality. So I, I don't go too crazy about it because I, I feel like I, I will overcall it. Um, you know, if I know that the, on a, like a, a biopsy they did looking for rejection or whatever they were looking for, if they see outflow obstruction, then I'm going to call a monophasic venous white form in my report, um, which is cheating. I know. Yeah. <laughs> You're just correlating. Yeah, exactly. I'm using all my resources. Exactly. I'm not cheating. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think I use the uh, facicity as much initially. Um, yeah, it, I agree. It's kind of hard to tell. And then sometimes, you know, like inevitably one of it, one of the hepatic veins will look abnormal while the others are normal. Um, or have more facicities, and I don't know what to do with those either, because right. it's probably unlikely that only one is affected. All right. All right. Good. Thank yeah. you. Agree.